you store a new huge bank called Key to finance. Hello. We're living in an electronic world. Electronic games, electronic watches, electronic calculators, and above all, electronic computers. Yes, computers seem to be everywhere these days. Just look at the number of computer magazines there are. If you go to your newsagent, you'll see rows and rows of them. And as for the computers themselves, well over a million microcomputers, like this one, have been sold in Britain. So what's happened? Why are there so many computers about? Well, these little things are the main reason. They're called silicon chips, and you could say that they're the brains of the computer. They do all the counting, the calculating, and the memorizing, and the sorting out of information. These chips are very small, very cheap, and they do their work at a fantastic speed. Take a number like this one. I think we'll take a very long one. 23,678. And we'll multiply it by 34,976. Ooh, that's difficult. How long would it take you to do that Some Ages, I expect. But thanks to the chip, the computer can do it in a fraction of a second. Here goes. Oh, and there's our answer. And what's more, we get the answer right every time. Computers are also good at working with letters and words. More and more office workers have started to use them instead of ordinary typewriters. This is a thank you letter I've written to my mum for the present she sent me for my birthday. And as usual, I've made a mistake. I've missed out a word. It's here. It's been so cold for the past that been so cold for the past month that so I'll just to pop that in if I press this button and that and then move the cursor which is the dash to where I want to insert the word there type in month M O N T H and there it is very neat and quick and no mess now, if I want the printer to type out the letter, all I do is press these buttons. Off it goes. Well, it's much quicker than me doing it. Fantastic. Computers can also be connected up to robots. What do you think that this one has been programmed to do? Tell you what, let's run the program and find out, shall we? And hopefully, if it's been programmed correctly, it should pick up the sugar lump, because I'm very, very lazy. I can't be bothered putting the sugar in my tea myself. And effortlessly, it swings across. And there we are. Lazy old me has sugar in his tea. Clever little machine, isn't it? Actually, it's not exactly clever, just very good at following instructions. Like all machines that are driven by computers, it will do exactly what it's told to do or programmed to do. So you have to make sure that you get the instructions exactly right. And when you're giving it the instructions or the program, you have to break the job down into different steps that the computer can understand. Sometimes people start by writing it out, something like this. Paul, can you come here a moment? Hang on, Sheila. I'm just... that's it. Sorry, I was just finishing off another programme. Right, what is it? Well, this is my grand plan for getting the robot to make the toast in the morning. Oh, what a great idea. So I want you to pretend to be my computer for a few minutes. See if the instructions make sense. Yes, Master. I will read and I will obey. That's what I like to hear. Right, we'll start at the beginning. Right. And my first instruction is go to bread bin. Mm -hmm. And here I am at the bread bin. 
What's next? Well, I'm asked a question. Is there bread in the bin? Yes, there's loads in there. Had the answer been no, if the bread bin had been empty, my instruction would have been to go to the shop and buy bread, put it in the bread bin, and then we'd have a full bread bin and we could carry on, couldn't we? So let's go to the next stage. Take out two slices. That's easily done. Go to toaster. That's not very far to walk at all. And another question. Is toaster empty? I'll bend over and have a look. Oh yes, nothing in there at all. So we can move on to the next stage. Put in bread. Fairly simple, even for somebody like myself. <laughs> Push down lever. And wait for toast to jump up. Great. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Uh, Sheila. Mm hmm. I'm going to be waiting an awfully long time for that toast to pop up. Why is that? You didn't include an instruction to put in the plug. Oh no. Back to the drawing board for me. <laughs> and it's back to the robot for me. Silly me. Well, this time the robot's been programmed to pick up a ball from one egg cup and put it into the other one. Here goes. Let's run the program and hope that that's what happens. Well, I seem to have programmed it correctly so far. There it goes, picking up the ball. Very gently. We don't want it squashed, do we? And across it goes. And hopefully, yes, there we are. It drops the ball into the other egg cup. And in fact, the robot arm will carry on doing this until I tell it to stop. Programming a computer does take some time, but once it's been done, the computer can hold the program in its memory, and the robot can go on doing exactly the same job over and over again until, I suppose, it dies of metal fatigue. It's a very boring job, that. Well, it is, that's right, and of course, that's one of the advantages of having robots, because they don't get bored and they don't make mistakes. So, if there are tiring, boring and exacting jobs to be done... Bring on the robots! We have program just to do Anything you want us to We are the robots We are the robots This is another type of robot that's used in some car factories. But they're not welding the cars together. What do you think they're doing? What they're doing is looking for places where water might leak into the car. They're leak detectors. The old-fashioned way to find leaks is to give the cars a shower and have a man sitting inside to see if any water is leaking in. But now, there's a new way of finding leaks. First, the inside of the car is pumped full of smelly gas. Then, the robots go to work. They smell around the car to find out if there are any places where gas is leaking out. The robot's nozzle is just like a big nose. You can see why these robots are nicknamed the sniffers. Once the sniffers have checked round the car, they sit back and let a computer printing machine do its work. It draws a picture of the car and marks the places where the gas has been leaking out. The drawing is then taken away so that the leaks can be fixed. Computers are amazing machines. As you've seen, they can work with robots, with words, with numbers, and they can also work with pictures. Computers control the pictures by dividing the screen up into little parts and then by telling those parts what to do. The more different parts there are on the screen, the better the pictures. Have a look at this. Can you tell what this is a picture of? I doubt it. So let's double the number of picture parts. It's still a bit difficult to see what it is, isn't it? But as we go on adding more and more parts, 
and adding more and more bits of picture information, the picture does start to become better and better, until finally it's a man's face. Somebody your teachers might even recognize. This computer here is one that artists and designers use for making pictures. It's really an amazing sketch pad. It looks amazing right enough. What are you going to do with it? I shall design you something, Paul. What would you like? Oh, let me think. How about the desert island of my dreams? Desert island of your dreams coming up. Wait a moment. I'll just draw the island first. Wait a minute. There you are. Let's fill that in. Lots of sand to wriggle your toes in. That's great. There's a lovely blue sea there, mm -hmm. too. But it looks very sunny there. Uh, how about some trees so trees. that I can shelter from the sun? A palm tree, I think, for somewhere hot. Oh, yes. Let's fill that in a bit. And some branches. That'll do. You didn't know I was so artistic, did I'm you? I'm most impressed. <laughs> Lovely green branches. You know, it'd be nice if they had something growing on them that I could eat. Hmm, right, coming up. I'll just choose a different brush, I think. What do you suggest we should put on the tree, then? Well, I think, um, coconuts for the... Oh, I love coconuts. ...for palm tree. So, coconuts. Lovely oh, bunch of coconuts. Terrific. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it looks a bit solitary there, doesn't it? I couldn't spend all day under one tree. It'd be nice if we had, say, a little forest or something, wouldn't it? A bit of shade, no problem. That'll take you ages to draw those, though, mm -mm. won't it? No, all I have to do is a dot there, mm -hmm. a box around it, and now I can plant them wherever I like. How about that? Good grief. Terrific. Don't have to go to the bother of drawing it millions of times. Hey, well, well, we've got a jungle here now. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Actually, I don't know about you, but when I go on picnics and things, I hate it when the sand gets in my sandwiches. So it would be really nice if I could have some grass to lie on. Right. We want some green for grass. Mm. So, green grass. There you go. Enough? Oh, yes, that stacks. That's great. This is terrific, the desert island of well, my dreams. There is one thing missing from this island, Paul. What's that? Well, it's you. Mm -hmm. Now, whereabouts? About here? Yeah. Yes. So this is me surfacing after swimming underwater. Nice big head. Oh, <laughs> dear, dear, that's unkind. <laughs> no, no, no. We've got to be able to see you. And a bit of hair. My hairdresser of... could see that. She wouldn't be very happy. And, oh, and an a arm. a big mouth. Yes, a large mouth <laughs> and an arm. Here we are. Giving a bit of a wave. Why have I got a blue face? <laughs> there we are. Magic. Same colour as the coconuts. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that is incredible? So I've got everything now. Oh, Paul, uh, you've gone terribly white. I've gone as white as a sheet. Why? Help. Sharks. Oh, no wonder I've gone as white as a sheet. You still want to stay on this island, no, do you? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not my idea of a perfect island, me swimming with shark-infested waters around me. Oh, no. Actually, that figures because I've been living quite dangerously recently. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't believe this, but did you know that I actually flew an airplane last week? You flew a real airplane? Have a look at this. Harbour Delta's rolling. Rotate. V2. Pulse to right. Undercarriage up. We need to come left onto 180 heading. That's fine. Let's let the nose go down a little. Nose down. Okay, Alan, do you think you could take control for me? Yes, I have control. Thank you. Well, as some of you may have guessed, I'm not actually flying a real airplane. Nobody would be daft enough to let me try that, not even with somebody as experienced as Alan sitting next to me and looking after me. 
I am, in fact, sitting inside a flight simulator, which is a machine that makes you feel that you are flying a real airplane. And this is what we're sitting inside. Looks like a big box on stilts, doesn't it? But this box on stilts is controlled by a very advanced computer. And it's a good example of just what computers can do. Well, the people who have programmed the computer that controls the simulator have taken information from real flights and real aeroplanes, fed it into the computer in such a way that when the pilot touches the controls and uses them, the simulator behaves exactly like a real aeroplane. These big robotic legs can push and pull the flight deck box in all directions. Imitating a bumpy flight in stormy weather is no trouble at all. These legs can also be used to give you the feeling of speeding up or slowing down. When the pilot starts to accelerate for takeoff, the flight deck is tilted up so that inside you're pushed back into your seat and it feels as if the aeroplane is speeding up. The feeling is also helped by what you hear and what you see. For instance, through the window, the pictures are created by the computer. And as I look out, I can see that we're flying at dusk. And in fact, I know that we're heading for Glasgow Airport. But simply by changing to another computer program, we can select a different airport and different conditions in which we land. This is Washington at 6 o'clock at night. This is Brussels at midnight. This is Norfolk in a storm. And this is Pittsburgh in fog. Well, I've never flown an airplane in my life, but with an awful lot of help from Alan here in the pilot's seat, I'm going to try and land this one at Glasgow Airport. Well, Alan, shall we have a bash at it? Yes, why not? Here goes. Back on the center line, Paul. Over to the left a bit. Speed's good. Under carries down, please, Paul. Under carries down. Just need to aim it about a third of the way down the runway. Let her come right. as she is. Very well. A little bit more power. Then. For you. That landing looked a bit bumpy, Paul. It wasn't quite perfect, was it? It was pretty bad, actually. In, in fact, if that had been for real, I would have burst all four tyres and bent the undercarriage. Oh, I'm glad I wasn't on board. Well, in today's programme, we've only had time to look at a tiny fraction of the things computers can do. Computers are used for so many things in so many different places. Factories, offices, banks, hospitals, airports. Computers really are everywhere. Yes, but don't think of them as taking over the world. Remember, computers are machines and they're only able to work after humans have told them what to do. Computers are our slaves, not our masters. At least, that's the way it ought to be. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>